It's time for Girls and Golf Podcast with your favorite hosts, Lex and Sarah. Ladies, when you're ready. Welcome to Girls and Golf. A very happy Thanksgiving week to you all. I'm Lex, joined by Sarah, and we are very excited to welcome an LPG Tour Pro to our podcast this week, Marina Alex. Thank you for joining us. Hi, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> We're super excited to have you. Um, we're going to talk a little golf, a little holiday cooking, and then we have um, a question for you at the end, which I'm going to let you prepare your mind for, okay. because the match is happening on Friday of this week. You're, yeah. It's airing on, this this episode's airing Wednesday, so it's happening on Friday, day after Thanksgiving. So I want you to think about while we're podcasting who you would like to play with in a match and who you would like Mm -hmm. to play against as well. It Mm -hmm. could be anybody. So just start thinking about that. But first, um, we want to introduce you a little bit to our listeners. You've been on tour for seven years. Um, You got a win under your belt. You played a Solheim Cup. Uh, What does it take, you know, to win on tour and to make that team and have the career that you've had? Yeah, it's been a really cool journey. Um, It's definitely gotten a bit better the last, I would say, three or four seasons that I've been playing. I had a lot of rookie mistakes and just things that, you know, you learn as you transition from one part of your life to the next. But I will say, you know, winning is hard. I think some people make it look really easy and you see multiple winners and, uh, you know, you think, oh, that's so achievable and doable, but it does take a lot of work um, and a lot of, I think, mental discipline that probably separates those really, really, really good players from the very good players. And I just think that it's not a whole lot of difference, but um, they just are probably a little bit um, more disciplined mentally and are they're able to repeat their good stuff, you know, all the time, which is something we all strive to work toward. Well, you have the number one driving accuracy as well. So do you want to speak a little bit to that? And how does that help your game? It's a weird stat. Like, I didn't really know that, that I, I had such a good driving accuracy until I was kind of like strolling through one day. And I was just like, oh, I'm a lot higher on that than I, <laughs> I realized. Um, I, I think my entire life I've always been, that's probably been my strong suit. Um, it's just being able to drive it straight and, I think in the last maybe four years, I've worked on gaining some distance along with that. So now I think um, my driving is definitely my uh, definitely the one thing I am the best at statistically, um, combined with the fact that I do love all of my Callaway drivers that I had in the bag. So, but uh, yeah, switching to the Maverick this year actually I think helped um, my accuracy a little bit. Um, I'm just this is probably the best numbers I've had um, driving wise. Like if you're looking at TrackMan stats um, since I've been on tour. So that's good. I think it's a combination of that and just working on some stuff on my swing. And, you know, it really helps. Um, we don't have stats that are as in depth as the PGA tour, but I know that strokes gained off of the T is like a really big deal on the PGA tour stats. And, although I may not be the longest, I think constantly being in the fairway is allow me to at least have opportunities to put myself in position for birdies moving forward. And so it's definitely, you know, starts, starts off the tee and ends on the green, but that, that really is like the thing that um, I think people do take for granted. What's your secret? What's to accuracy? Um, (laughs) I'd like to know. It's funny, like without getting too technical with it, um, I've always had a difficulty, like really this is going to sound crazy because I'm a professional golfer and you always are like striving to compress the golf ball and like really get like a strong impact position. And I've always struggled with that. I always, I've had just like a little bit of a natural like release with my right hand. And I, and I'm, I work really hard to like fix that to get, become a better iron player. But I really think that that lens for being a good driver, like I swing a little bit up and I don't really like to swing down on it and like hit the ground first it's just doesn't seem natural. So, um, I think that's allowed me to like always just be a pretty decent driver of the golf ball. It's just like how I swing affords me to do that well. And then I have to work hard to get the rest of my game to match that up. You know, mentioning the PGA tour, I think some people get so caught up in the discussion that's going on right now about distance. There's a lot of distance on the ladies tour. They just, people, Oh, 
it's not as quite like explosive and there you don't have women gaining 40 pounds <laughs> to no, try no. and hit it farther and that's gonna be like yeah that sounds like a great idea for me long term <laughs> um, <laughs> definitely definitely want to bulk up and it's super you know that's not what anyone's looking for <laughs> but but what about the longer driver shafts because we even saw it with dylan fratelli out in augusta oh. he has you know a 46 inch shaft I don't is that something that the ladies do People realize is Brooke Henderson plays with a 47 inch driver. I think she's played with it most of her career. That is borderline what Bryson was testing for the masters. I mean, granted she doesn't use the entire shaft the way um, those guys do in the sense that she chokes down on it. And like, there's a lot of the shaft at the top of her grip, but I do think that that definitely contributes in some way to her, to her length. Um, she hits it pretty far. I don't know if it's just a total weight or, or what it is. Her swing is like smooth and long, um, you know, well past parallel. So it, it works for her, but I'm pretty sure that's something she's done almost her entire career, but it, it doesn't really get talked about. I don't think that much, um, but she's, she's been in the long driver game. I think even way before Bryson for sure. And I'm not sure about the um, Dylan. I, I don't, I've only really heard about the price and long drive, long <laughs> night driver deal. And Phil was using it, I think, at the Houston Open. Yeah, yeah. We definitely saw Phil put in, I think it was 47 and a half inches yeah. is what his coach a said. Inch, so, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> back to the driving that is out on tour because you have ladies mm -hmm. like Ann Van Dam and whatnot yeah. and Lexi who have always been long hitters yeah. um where does the power come from too, for like, women what's that where does the power come from for like female drivers I I think it it's a, a it has to be a lower body um strength I think like anatomy from an anatomy standpoint women's lower bodies are stronger proportionally than men to their upper bodies so you know a lot of us use our hips and our core and our and our quads to really generate power i mean another great long driver um maria fossi who's been out a couple years now i mean if you look at her physically she her lower body is so strong and you can really see her use her legs to generate all of that speed and space um and that's probably the main difference i think men's side versus women's side the guys can really use their upper body to like, maybe that continues, like why they hit it so much further. Like that's a total, like a very balanced power. But for us, you know, it's, it's mainly lower body driven, which I think, and I could be completely like, now that we're talking about it, I'm just speculating maybe because we don't overpower things with our upper body, like, and we just kind of allow our hands and our arms to like follow, maybe it contributes to our consistency. Um, because we just don't, I don't feel like we have a lot of variation in like where the ball goes and the club face control is extremely good. I actually agree with that. And like, I mean, I'm by no means an LPGA player. I'm not even like a decent player. I don't really like, know about mechanics that well. So I'm like, just, yeah, whenever yeah. you try to like, like in my opinion, if you try to hit it harder, it always goes left or right. But if I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to take it easy and do my thing yeah. it's straight. And I think if you like are using your core as your source of power and your arms and your hands can remain kind of like relaxed and there's not, there's not a lot of tension and you're not using that to generate the speed. Um, I think it just allows you to repeat that, um, the club face control motion over and over and over again to the point where it's just becomes so habit that, you know, you become very accurate. How much when you guys are out on tour, is there any like comparing of those like core routines, like things you're doing to strengthen your body? I know like Morgan Pressel's gotten really big into Peloton. I see, um, you know, the Corda sisters doing a lot of like core strengthening and whatnot. Madeline, mm -hmm. Madeline Sagstrom the same. So I'm just, I'm yeah. just curious really cool stuff like on the stability ball um mm -hmm. which I'm very envious of because I can't do that but I think a lot of players I mean I definitely like to watch what other people do especially if I know that they're they're doing something well whether that's in the gym or on the range or putting or whatever um so I definitely do peek at like other people's fitness routines can just try and see if that makes sense or if it's applicable to me like another um, Ryan O'Toole is huge in fitness and she posts a lot of videos of what she does with her trainer. And a lot of that stuff is really functional for golf. Um, there are some, 
there's definitely players who I think have dived deep into the fitness element of improving their games. And it is important. Um, you can change a lot in the gym that you can then take to the golf course. What do you guys think about um, like golf influencers and like where they play a role in like in the golf industry? It's really interesting. Um, I think that there is a lot of great golf influencers out there for the game. And, and that the thing that I think I struggle with as a player is if you're in, if you understand golf, you watch golf, you know who's more of an influencer and who is more of an actual playing professional. And I think there's a lot, there are sometimes is a crossover confusion for a fan who doesn't quite know that much. And I think that's where the frustration comes. And I notice it more on the female side than I do the men's side where, you know, a average Joe would know if someone is a PGA tour player, not a golf influencer. And I think that we get a little bit of like that, line can be very blurred. And I don't think that that is necessarily helping our brand recognition a ton. Um, but I do think they do serve like a valuable purpose in growing the audience of golf for sure, making it cool and, um, trendy. And it's definitely more relatable in a lot of ways than like anything I would, any of the content that I would put on my Instagram or a lot of professionals would put on their Instagram. So there is Definitely a great place for it. I just think it's more of an educational issue amongst like our fan base. So I agree with that. Um, there's so many new things happening um, and it's been really helping because golf in general has been always viewed as like a traditional kind of stuffy game. Yeah. So what can we do to, to help revolutionize that? That's a really hard question. <laughs> I think how we're doing it a little bit is good in terms of just creating new content, content that is relatable to younger generations, because that's who we ultimately like need to get into golf. But I just think the vibe of playing golf itself probably needs to modernize. Um, it, it's simple as, you know, attire, dress code, like what you can and cannot wear at a golf course. Um, that really sometimes turns people away. Um, you know, if you go to a public course, you know, like, I don't see why you couldn't be able to wear what you want, even if you wanted to bring your dog out. Like, you know, there's a lot of things that like kind of make golf a little bit unapproachable. And I think that if we could just figure out how to be okay with letting some of that go. It doesn't necessarily need to um, change the integrity of the sport because, you know, there's still the rules I feel like make golf so unique in the sense that you have to kind of be honorable when you're playing, whether you're playing for fun or you're playing in a competition, like, you know, that's the part of golf that I think is unique because you have to call penalties on yourself or you're keeping your opponent's score. Like there are, different elements um that I think can always be preserved without it needing to be like so rigid in in how we approach it I think there just can be more fun ways to play what about the intensity of junior golf you know you mm. hear a lot about like dance moms and like people that get yeah. super passionate about their kids and I think the same thing can happen in oh, yeah. any sport but it definitely happens in golf how much pressure do you think should be on junior golfers and it's then crazy. when they develop? I mean, I was probably at an age, I'm 30. So when I was, I don't, I guess it's been 15 years since like high school golf days, junior golf days. And I, anyone who was anyone was at the IMG Academy, um, trying to become pretty much the best golfer on the planet at 16 years old, which is crazy when you think about it. Um, there's a burnout factor, I think, in every sport, you know, regardless of who you are, if you are just pushed to the max at a young age, I just, it's really difficult to keep that up and like keep, keep the enjoyment up. And I think that that, I'm sure it still exists, um, like academies where you're solely focused on golfing you go to school a couple hours, but it's like your main priority is, is to be a golfer. And it just, it kind of hurts. I think the well-rounded element of your childhood, you know, you, sometimes you're like, okay, I'm ready to turn pro because you're so good at 
such a young age and then you miss out maybe on a college experience. I mean, there's a lot of good and bad, you know, I, I don't know, you could go out and kill it. And then like, you have an amazing career at a young age and that's wonderful, but you know, there's definitely pros and cons to that. And, um, I don't think everyone that goes down that route ends up finding the success that they think that they were going to have. So what keeps you grounded now that you've been on tour for a long time and you've been playing for so long? Yeah. Um, I enjoy cooking in my off time. Um, I enjoy just, yeah, I enjoy just getting away from golf a little bit, you know, taking breaks, even if that doesn't mean doing a whole lot, but just not feeling the pressure. It's a lot of it's self pressure to like go practice or play every tournament that you could possibly play in. I mean, you know, there are times where you're just like, I, just need to get away, need a vacation, um, hanging out with my friends, you know, just taking trips to see, um, friends that I've made that I don't get to see all the time, just kind of switching things up a little bit just allows me to, um, not feel like golf is totally dictating my life, which I think is healthy. <laughs> and no one wants their job to like overtake everything about them. We're definitely big advocates of a like work-life balance over here, yeah. especially on the podcast of not having golf or anything consume you so much that that's, that's it for you. So yeah. let's, let's go into your cooking a little bit. Like okay. what is your favorite thing to cook or wait first, let me backtrack. Okay. Easiest thing for you to put together. If you like don't have dinner plans. If I don't have dinner plans and I'm entertaining people, mm -hmm. um, that would probably be some sort of pasta with like, uh, with tom like a tomato base. And it doesn't even need to be like canned tomatoes. Like I just like chopping up fresh tomatoes, cooking them down. You can throw anything in there, shrimp, vegetables, chicken. Um, it's easy. It works like every time <laughs> and it doesn't take a whole lot of time to be perfectly honest. Um, if I have more time, I really enjoy making risotto. Um, and I think that that's like, it's really filling and everyone's usually pleased. You don't, you don't need a whole lot else to go with that. Maybe just like a salad or something. Cause it's, it's a pretty hefty meal. So that's actually like a very good, um, I wouldn't say it's a loophole, but if you don't want to have to prepare a lot, um, that's hearty. And like, you don't need to do a whole lot more with that, but it just takes like about an hour which yeah. is sometimes people don't have that. Yeah. It depends. I make time for it. <laughs> so now that uh, Thanksgiving is a week away, is it? Yeah, <laughs> it'll be, by the time people are listening, it'll be the next day. It'll be tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> uh, so since we're so close to Thanksgiving, do you have any uh, family recipes that you love? Yeah, um, we do a lot of like the traditionals. Um, stuffing, sweet potatoes, cranberry, all that. But I think our stuffing, I didn't know um, this because I've obviously only grown up eating really one stuffing. Um, but I don't think it's made a very traditional way. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, and I can tell you how we do it because it's kind of a little strange, uh, similar to how we make meatballs too in a, in a weird way. Like we, um, it's sausage and mushroom and onion based stuffing. So like cook a ton of that in a giant pot, all okay. of it down, like with olive oil, salt, pepper, parsley, like you season all of that. And then when it's cooked all the way down and it's very warm, we add like a ton of egg and a ton of white bread that we've like lightly soaked and like wrung out. And it's basically just like very moist bread, like clumps. And we mix all of that together with some grated cheese. And then when it's hot, we actually stuff it in the turkey the night before, put it in the fridge, and then the leftovers we put in a pan, put that in the fridge, and then cook it all the next day. But I think a lot of people use like breadcrumb, um, which I don't know if that's more traditional or popular or what. But I think ours is a little bit, a um, little bit non-traditional. I've never actually been a part of making my family stuffing and like thinking about it now, I, all I can think is that I know that we use sausage. Oh, I good. know that okay. there's onion, some sort of either potato or bread, okay. starchy, something it's yeah, starch starchy, right? Um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm so such a novice when it comes to Thanksgiving dinner. And I thought about this when I was asking you for a Thanksgiving recipe, because I was like, <laughs> I couldn't even give one. I, I know how to make my mom's meatballs. And I know how to cook other things. But like Thanksgiving dinner, I don't even know if I could roast a whole a whole turkey. You can, I promise without, you, you can. without directions. I think I but, could with directions. Yeah. But off our instinct. Tradition, like we've always done it is like my mom, my mom's sisters, myself, my brother, my dad doesn't really get that involved in the whole cooking element. Um, and we will make the stuffing on Wednesday and stuff the turkey. Like that's what we've done my entire life. And we've always all done it together. But how the rest of the sides are made, I honestly do not know. <laughs> Even the cranberry, like it's made from scratch and I don't know how to make it. I have never touched cranberries in my life. Sarah, you're, um, you have like Midwestern them, I think it's water. It's and intimidating. Uh, there, yeah. It's a process. I can actually pay more attention this year, but um, my mom just, my mom or my aunt always does all of it and wow. I don't watch. <laughs> <laughs> my cousin, it's funny because I'm the same way. My mom and her sisters, they take care of everything and they like divvy it up. Somebody does the sweet potatoes with the brown mm -hmm. sugar and the marshmallows and everything. Yeah. My cousin finally chipped in last year and was like, I'm going to make Brussels sprouts. And we were like, oh, thanks. Great. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know what it's going to be like this year. Obviously, everyone's Thanksgivings are going to be very different. But if you want to learn to make Marina's stuffing, she's going to be kind enough to give us the recipe. I will give you the recipe. And I will say the quantity is insane. So it's like for stuffing a very large turkey. So just scale back if you're not <laughs> stuffing a 20 pound turkey, like not everyone is. So when it says five pounds of sausage, you don't really need five pounds. <laughs> oh my gosh. Cut the, the quantities down. <laughs> Five pounds of sausage. I know. We already down. have like a big turkey. <laughs> Literally, the turkey goes in. It's like a thirty-five pound turkey. Once in the oven, it takes, it takes all day to cook. <laughs> like alarm is set at four a.m. Someone's putting the turkey in. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing! I wish we could uh, send you a GoPro to do a time lapse of this turkey. Yeah, uh, that's I'll incredible. I'll have to take some after pictures. <laughs> yeah. What about like a non-traditional Thanksgiving dinner? I know like um, I know a few people who would like despise turkey, which I, I think know. is crazy. I love roasted turkey, but I, I, um, I don't know what I would eat. Other than um, I think I think steaks are actually um, like common or a roast is common. Um, I have never really had a non-traditional turkey. For the first time a few years ago, um, our neighbors came over as well. And we actually had like a, quite a big amount of people and they brought a deep fried turkey, which I had never had. And so good. Up to it, I, I just didn't know that was a thing really. Um, and it's juicy. It's very good, but I know it's a fire hazard, I think to try and cook one. <laughs> I, I don't know if you watched Gilmore Girls, but I was a huge Gilmore Girls fan. Okay. Well, in season three, they have this thing thanksgiving episode and where they go to like four different thanksgiving dinners they like overbook themselves for thanksgiving <laughs> and one of them one of them is like deep frying a turkey and the people that are hosting it their friends they get like really drunk and uh make like a big like fire ring on the lawn and it's like a whole thing that's like all i can imagine when doing a deep fried turkey because you have to have the vat of oil and the whole Ew. Shebang. I read somewhere, and I don't know if this is true or not, a few years ago, it's, like, actually the most, like, common day for injuries or, or home accidents is Thanksgiving, people trying to deep fry their turkeys. It's not that safe. You really have to be experienced. Well, they say, what do they say, go big or go home, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, you know what? Now this year, they already have COVID to worry about. I don't want to hear about people hurting themselves deep frying their turkeys. <laughs> yeah, no, it's going to be a sad Thanksgiving. <laughs> Please use the oven and use your best discretion. <laughs> um, well, before we let you go, now you've had a little bit to think about who you'd want in your match. Oh, I would. I, I, I really didn't think I, about it, but. <laughs> well i'll give you i'll give you a second i'm gonna ad lib here i just met tiff joe a couple oh. weeks ago out at vista valley so i think she would be hilarious either to have as your partner or to have as on course commentary she's a really really good friend of mine um we've stayed together a lot on the road she's 
so funny. What a character. She's great. She would be good on course commentary, actually. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I've always, like, Michelle's a really good friend of mine, and I've always wanted to play a match with her, whether it's, like, the team event. We, we were going to try and play the first year, and then she ended up having some injury issues and, like, couldn't play at that time. But I was bummed with that. And um, we never really got to overlap Solheim wise, but I think it would be awesome to play a match like her as my partner. And I mean, I know Steph is playing this match, but they definitely have some like good golf, like beef and they like to banter back and forth and play. So I think it would be cool to have him on the other side. Now who his partner would be. I'm not sure. Um, Let's see. Well, he's going to be partnering with Peyton Manning. Yeah. I mean, I like Peyton. That's not like, that's not like dream for me. I probably yeah. Phil okay. Mickelson. I think that would be cool. I've always wanted to play with him or, and I have never, or just like watch him just chip mm-hmm. for 700 hours. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he would be fun to play in a match. He's got really, I mean, he was awesome in the other match that they had um, mm-hmm. whenever that was in May. Yes. The yeah. champions was for he, was he charity Brady's? was in May. <laughs> Huh? Was he Brady's partner? Phil was with Brady and Tiger yeah. was, was Yeah, they have really great, um, good on-course banter. I just feel like he would be fun and very into it. So I think that would yeah. be a fun that would be a fun match. Well, you know what's great is you just named people that we have connections to, and <laughs> my boss, Jeff Newbarth, happens to produce the match. So I'm gonna put a bug in his ear. Maybe we okay. can make this happen. Next match. <laughs> We need some females in the matches, so I think uh, we got to get Michelle ready. Um, yeah. We need to get her in the practice regiment. <laughs> <laughs> we will. We will definitely work on it. And if you, uh, I mean, we'll see what happens after people watch Charles. I know everybody loves to poke fun at Charles Barkley, myself no, I think included. He's gonna go I think he's going to be great. His game has to be better. I don't think he would put himself out there like this to do the match if he didn't feel a little bit more confident in his golf game. <laughs> I, at least I hope so. <laughs> well, we'll find out. For in everyone's two days. sake, I, Charles is bringing his A game. <laughs> well marina thank you so much for joining us if you don't follow marina already you can find her on twitter at marina underscore d with three e's or on instagram at marina with three a's at the end and d e e (laughs) that's me to do that back in the day but here we are and i have not changed it (laughs) can't change it now because this is how people find you you can't you're locked in for life they don't tell you those things when you (laughs) sign up for accounts when you're like 20 (laughs) i'm just glad my first email address is not what it was because there is a frog involved i don't want to let's just anyways it's time to wrap um thank you so much for joining us we'll definitely have you back and if you want marina's stuffing we will post that in the podcast description uh when this comes out so thank you everyone next week we will have kira k dixon join us to talk about the u.s women's open yay Bye.